Looking for books that stop the summer slide? Welcome to JLG's webcast series, Books We Love. I'm Kaylee Hanlon. From books that make you laugh out loud to a tissue book or two, you'll find that the books in today's webcast will keep kids reading all summer long and well into next school year. Kira Parrott, School Library Journal and Library Journal's Review Director and former children's librarian, joins Deb for a look at 12 books you and your readers will also love. Please join the conversation on Twitter. Tweet us at JR Library Guild or hashtag JLG Webcast. If you have any questions or comments, send those in at any time via the red Q&A box. Deb, I see that you have a book we almost featured before. I know that it was recently received high acclaim. That's right, Kaylee, it did. And when Shelly Diaz from School Library Journal joined us a couple months ago, she couldn't talk about Vincent and Theo because she's on a committee that is considering and should consider, I'm just saying, my personal opinion, um, as a winner for their notable <laughs> list. But she's not here, so we can talk about it. Um, and, yeah, two weeks ago at um, Day of Dialogue, it was announced as the nonfiction award winner for the Boston Globe Horn Book. So, yay for Vincent and Theo. Yay. And thanks, Kira, for joining us today. Yeah, it's a um, pleasure so to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks. And welcome back. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, last time you came, we were predicting the future, I think. That's right. We were looking at potential Newberry and other award yeah, contenders. And, right. Yep. And so now we can say what we want to about these books that we love, and you don't want to miss them. So I love so much Vincent and Theo, and I know Kaylee just finished reading it herself. Um, but one of the things I love about this story is, you know, we all know Vincent Van Gogh, and you know the thing about the ear and the girlfriend and all those kind of things, but maybe you don't know very much about his younger brother, Theo. And so in this um, long biography, um, I learned that there were over 700 letters that Theo and Vincent wrote back and forth to each other. Can you imagine, Kiera? Wow. 700 Incredible. letters. Just to think of letter writing culture back in the day. It it was. I mean, because that was that's how you communicated. There was no phone. There was no internet. And I think just the thought of that alone will just boggle the minds of the teen <laughs> readers who get their hands on this book. Um, but even more than that was this bond that the two of them had and how if it weren't for Theo, we would not have Vincent Van Gogh's work. I mean, he literally supported Vincent and his um, peculiarities, I guess I'll say. Um, <laughs> he financially supported him. He lived with him. Um, but they had this amazing bond in spite of all the, you know, not so great things that happened with Vincent and the bad mistakes that um, Vincent often made. Um, once you get this book, you're definitely going to want to make sure you have copies of these letters. Kids are going to want to read them. They're going to want to mm -hmm. finally, yay, open your 700s books with um, <laughs> the work of Vincent Van Gogh. They're going to want to look at these pictures um, of that you probably already have in your collection. So um, be sure that you do that. I have, however, put in the live binder for this title um, a link to the letters, um, and they're nice and typed, so you won't have to decipher anybody's handwriting. So for sure, a book I love, um, Vincent and Theo by Deborah Heiligman. What a great idea, and I love the idea of tying in um, art history um, into that and other sections of your collection. That's, that's really great. Um, and I love that yep. it's narrative nonfiction. We have a couple titles uh, later on. Um, something that I'm very attracted to, and I know a lot of people are looking for narrative nonfiction for, um, narrative nonfiction for older readers. Um, but first, I have a middle grade pick, um, Restart, by the great Gordon Corman. Um, so a few things. Not only did SLJ recently give Restart uh, a star, which means that we think it's particularly distinguished in terms of the writing and the character development and all of that, but we also included it on our monthly popular picks list. So for those of you who don't know what that is, this is a list that we produce every month, just like we produce our stars list. And we also print it in the back of the magazine right before our stars page, which is always the very last page of the magazine. Um, and we put them up on the website. Popular picks are different than stars. These are titles that we think are going to be, well, 
you know, really popular with readers. They're books that we tend to think um, are going to circulate um, very highly. And if you can afford it in your book budget, we recommend having um, several copies of them because we think they're going to be that popular. So um, some books get a star, some books get a pop, some books get neither, and very rarely do books get both. But Restart is one of those rare books that we believe is both distinguished in terms of, in terms of its literary quality, but it's also the kind of book that kids will flock to, even reluctant readers. So the premise here, you've got 13-year-old Chase Ambrose who has a, um, an accidental fall which causes um, amnesia. He doesn't really remember all that much from his life before the fall. And so he begins learning about himself through other people. And what he discovers is that he was um, a really sportsy kind of jock. He was captain of the football team. Um, but he also learns that he was not such a great person, that he was actually the biggest bully in his middle school. Um, he was such a mean person that he made his peers' lives pretty miserable, um, and even his home life, his little, his own little sister um, was afraid of him. That's how terrible he was. Um, so now it's like he's got this blank slate. He's been given this new chance to start over, and he determines to really become um, a better, kinder person and can't even conceive that he was this awful, um, really mean-spirited person before this accident. So he sets out to become kinder and better, um, but he's had, he has some difficulty getting there. One of the obstacles is his really ultra-competitive dad, um, and also he has a pair of best friends um, who, you know, sort of egg him on and, and are sort of part of uh, that life he was living. So he's trying to figure out if he can make amends for his past um, and how to go about doing that. So, you know, we've seen stories before in, in middle grade and YA about selective amnesia, so it might be easy to think, oh, you know, I've read this kind of thing before. Um, and that's sort of, too, what I thought when I first started out reading. Um, but then, you know, Gorman, uh, Gordon Corman's prose um, just knocked me out. He has such a knack for really bringing authentic humor, laugh-out-loud scenes that are very relatable, um, characters that kids will recognize and root for and care about. Um, and this idea of change and sort of, you know, reconciling your past mistakes and learning from them is such an important one for kids in middle school especially. You know, this is a time where they're trying to figure out who they are and who they want to be um, and sort of understand that, you know, we make mistakes and, you know, how do you sort of recover? How do you move beyond those mistakes? Um, I honestly think um, this is one of Gorman, Cor Gordon Corman's best titles he's ever written, and I can really see this book working well um, in like a book club setting as a book club or reading circle pick. There's so much to discuss, um, and it's really engaging and fun. So that Absolutely. is Restart. Um, one of my I, favorites. It's one of my favorites, too. And, you know, it's one of those, when you see him, you just kind of pet the cover because you know you're going mm -hmm. to you're gonna <laughs> like the book. And I, I, like you, I was surprised at how much I learned, you know, how much the character yeah. changed in the story. So, yep. So now on to an elementary title. Yes. Kira, you, you oh, take this one. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> this is the inimitable Rita Williams Garcia. I mean, anytime she has a new book out, I feel like it's cause for celebration. Um, so this is Clayton Bird Goes Underground. And like Restart, this book also, unsurprisingly, received an SLJ star recently. Um, and I also, I did a roundup of, of new middle grade uh, titles that also really work well for reading aloud. Um, there are plenty of great, you know, elementary and middle grade titles out there. Some of them are, you know, work well to read aloud and some don't. This um, definitely fits the bill um, for both an individual read and the classroom um, read aloud. And it's no wonder. I mean, Williams Garcia, uh, she's just so gifted with her prose, um, just language that flows just effortly off the page. You know, sometimes I, I pick up a book and I think, you know, oh, this, this is great writing. Oh, now I, <laughs> now I remember, you know, <laughs> there's just some, something so effortless about her writing and her character development, the dialogue that just feels completely authentic. Um, so this is the story of this kid named Clayton Bird. And Clayton has sort of a complicated family, and the relationships among his family members are complex. So you've got his mom, um, who is very strict 
and very demanding sort of person. Um, there's his dad, and his mom sort of refuses to marry his dad, um, which is complicated, um, though his dad is, a, is an important presence in his life. The main male figure um, is really his grandfather, whose name is Cool Papa. Um, and Cool Papa is a huge influence on Clayton, um, even though his mom doesn't always approve. Um, cool Papa is a blues musician, and Clayton often tags along with him when he plays with his band, the Blues Men, in Washington Square Park in New York City. Um, and if you are a New Yorker or have you ever been to New York, one of the things I love about this book is she just gets New York City and all these locations perfect. Um, they just spring to life. They're so vivid. They're so real. Um, and even if you haven't been to New York and visited these locations, after you read this, you will feel like you have. Um, they sort of seep into you. Um, so um, without, you know, this isn't spoiling anything too much because it happens relatively early on in the book, um, that cool papa does die unexpectedly. And this is sort of the turning point for Clayton. He, his whole world is just rocked. And it's really about his struggle with his grief and sort of his journey to acceptance. Um, he's a really complicated character, um, and, I, and I appreciate that. And I think real um, readers will really um, relate to him and root for him, even as he makes some really bad decisions along the way. Um, we've seen a lot of books in the last couple of years about death, about the grieving process, about family and relationships and how these things play out for, for kids. Um, but this book really does sort of stand out and rise above the rest, I would say, for its depth. There's humor. Um, there's just such a respect for the inner life of the protagonist. Um, and it's, you know, it's Rita Williams Garcia. It's outstanding. Um, it just came out last month, and, um, you know, I think Deb and I were saying that it could be, I think anyway, I think Deb agree, you would agree, um, a Newberry contender. I, I don't see why not. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. And so are lots of other people in my social media world. So yeah, I would not uh, be surprised. Yeah. So um, what, one of the things that we've done with our 30 minutes, we only have time to talk about 12 books, is we've done a couple of things. One, because it's K to 12, we chose four elementary, four middle, and four um, high school books. But in your handout, um, so if you go to the resources folder, there's a handout. You can click and download that. You'll see not only those 12 titles, but you'll also see Da -da, two related titles, and they might be um, titles by the author or on the same subject or something like that. Some of them are upcoming releases, and some are the books that are um, 5 and $7 at JLG right now. So, um, mm. Jim and Dixie. Ooh, I said it right, didn't I? Or did I? <laughs> nice job. You did, you did. Where I'm from, I say G-E-M and J-I-M the same way. You just have to pay attention, you know. And also, you know, G-Y-M, that's where I go to watch people work out. But this is a story about a girl named Jem. And she even mentions that in her story, Jem and Dixie and their sisters. And these two sisters have never – this is one of those tissue books. It's not blue, as we've talked about blue tissue books before. <laughs> but um, – it's not blue, but it's a story about two sisters who really just have a tough time. They don't have any adult stability in their life at all. They they can't even rely on their mom to be sure they have food in their house. And so all along, Jem has been taking care of her younger sister, Dixie, until they get to high school, and suddenly Dixie is all popular. She's the cuter one. She's the more popular one. And Jem has, um, is kind of shrinking into herself and and into a little tough place uh, where she feels like the mm. only adult in her family and she it's breaking her heart that her sister has put this wall in between them and then all of a sudden her dad comes back or their dad comes back and um, at that point she's got to make a decision that could take away the one thing that she loves most in her life and it's a hard decision. And I, or the whole time I'm reading it, I just you want to wrap your arms around both these girls. And um, mm. it's just it's a tough, tough story. But I'm afraid so many children um, and young adults feel like that. Um, and so I think it's an important mm -hmm. read, and certainly one that kids would want to um, talk about as well. And it's also a popular pick from SLJ. So get more than one copy. 
Back to our middle school group, we have Bone Jack, and I wanted to read this one just from the cover. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, it just kind of draws you in. First you see this deer, and then you realize, well, we're going down this path to the woods. Um, And um, it's a great mystery. It reads kind of like a folktale. It's got a little bit of horror stuff going on in there and um, fantasy. It's just a ton of amazing page-turning story um, about a boy named um, Ash, and he and his best friend Mark have been friends forever, and all of a sudden um, Mark's dad um, kills himself because he's hit a hard spot and just done. And so it breaks up kind of the relationship between Ash and Mark, but it's the year of the um, the stag chase, and Ash has won the place to be the the leader of the um, of the race, and so um, he's all prepared to do that. At the same time, Ash's father comes home from um, military service, and he's got post traumatic stress disorder, and he can't come out of his own shell. And so, this great moment that he's been waiting for his whole life to be like his father, to run the race, to be the leader, just like his dad was, now has all these complications around it and then it gets worse when mark has gone to take in to live in the woods and he tells um ash that if he wins he's gonna have to kill him dun 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 and that's all i'm gonna tell you (laughs) it's fantastic i read this a couple weeks ago um yeah gripping atmospheric and the writing the writing is just stellar um just beautiful it is it is um all right, and back to elementary folks. Yeah, so this is a picture book, Jabari Jumps by Gaia Cornwell. I have to say this is probably one of my uh, favorite picture books that have come out this year. Um, it really reminded me of the first time I read The Snowy Day. Um, you know, how you, you, know, you open that book and you see little Peter walking through that snow-covered cityscape, and it sort of evokes all of those feelings of wonderment, you know, at those milestone moments in a child's life. Um, That's the feeling that you get in this book, which stars a little boy named Jabari, who is gathering his courage at the community pool as he contemplates um, doing a big jump off of the diving board. Um, He looks up, and he sees that diving board seemingly so, so, so very far up in the air, and he really begins to doubt himself, even though he's had swim lessons, and even though he knows he has the skills to do it, um, he's just not sure. Um, And I love that. It's just such a perfectly childlike moment, so grounded in the experiences of young children. Um, And he's with his dad that day, and his dad very reassuringly tells him to take a deep breath and that it's okay to feel scared. Um, What I love about it is that Jabari comes to a decision on his own, even though his dad encourages him and is there for him. It's ultimately Jabari who makes that decision and, spoiler alert, makes the big jump, um, (laughs) which I think is really empowering (laughs) for young kids. Uh, The artwork is gorgeous. Um, uh, The the illustrations have this sort of muted colors and texture to it that really give the illustrations um, sort of like a faded, like a sun-faded look, um, which is very appropriate for a very summertime read. I really think that um, this is sort of a classic picture book, and I think it'll it'll be a classic that gets read aloud, not just in the summertime, uh, but throughout the year. It's just charming. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan, too, and it's a debut. It is, which is remarkable because the illustration I, and the writing is so I great. I know. I know. I love a debut. Um, we've had a couple of questions about um, appropriateness of books. So before, Kira, you talk about mm. um, the, our next book, which is um, a young adult book, um, just mm-hmm. know that uh, – remember that as a Junior Library Guild member, those of you who are new to Junior Library Guild, it's like a magazine subscription. It's the good housekeeping seal of reading approval and the first award a book gets. Um, and so if you're a member and you're logged in, you can look at the book and see if there's any potentially sensitive areas like language or sex or uh, violence or racial slurs or things like that. And so in the case of Bone Jack, there is mild language, but it's nothing that I, I remember flinching. And I'm, you know, five years old still in my head, so I flinch. I, yeah, I just do. <laughs> um, so tell us about Dreamfall. 
Yes. Okay. So this is something completely different. It's my YA pick, um, Dream Small by Amy Pl uh, Plum. It's also an SLJ popular pick. So yes, one of those titles we think is going to be really popular and fly off the shelves. Um, so this is a sci-fi slash horror tale. It stars a group of teenagers who are test subjects in a sleep disorder study. So these are teens who have dealt with nightmares, recurring night terrors, sleepwalking, insomnia, all sort of um, issues around sleep. And they're promised as part of this study that they will finally um, get some relief and a good night's sleep. But as the test begins, a malfunction occurs and the teens wind up trapped inside of a shared nightmare and they must navigate their way through this terrifying dreamscape without being killed by really horrifying creatures like zombies and really terrifying for me personally sinister clowns <laughs> um, this is the kind of book which i'm very terrified of um this is the kind of book though that i would have loved as a young teen i could not get enough of scary story stories and horror and i know that some folks especially parents and you know sometimes shy away from horror and they they don't love the idea of their teens or tweens reading really scary things but i do like to always remind people that scary literature does serve an important function um, around emotional literacy. It allows kids to sort of experience really strong emotions like terror um, in a safe environment. That's an empowering environment because they can put the book down, they can close the cover anytime they want. So they're in control, um, which is a really empowering thing for a lot of young readers. Um, and especially for readers who love those spine tingling, you know, tales. Um, this is a page turner. It's a sort of unput downable thriller. Um, and ironically, when you're finished with it, I think teens will have a little trouble maybe falling asleep, just a little bit. <laughs> oh, yikes. <laughs> well, I guess segue right to this next one, because here you are, you got the same kind of thing going on. There you because go. Because <laughs> in, yeah, in the thickety, this is the fourth book of the series. Um, Kara and Taff are back, and they're looking for, um, hidden pieces of of an evil grimoire um, so that they can um, defeat Rygoth and her army of witches. And so we have a final good versus evil battle, and every time you think, they've escaped the horrible things, mm -hmm. something else happens, right? Um, so it's page-turning. You almost read it in one chunk, and it's if you've read the others, you know they're, they are not short. Um, but they are mm -hmm. so good and riveting, and I, I think that you'll like the ending. Um, so definitely a must um, for summer reading. And uh, if you haven't started the series, you should. It's great. It's great. All right, speaking of it's great, The Legend of Rock, <laughs> Paper, Scissors. So I heard about this book long before I ever saw it. Drew Daywalt is the uh, creator, inventor, genius behind the day the crayons quit. And so here we have the legend of rock, paper, scissors. And then it's illustrated by Adam Rex. I mean, what a team, right, Kira? <laughs> Incredible. It is so cute. <laughs> it is so cute. Where's Oh, so I shall read to you. We didn't read from a book yet, so I will read to you just the beginning. Long ago, in an ancient and distant realm called the Kingdom of Backyard, there lived a warrior named Rock. Rock was the strongest in all the land, but he was sad because no one could give him a worthy challenge. Rock traveled to the mysterious forest of over by the tree swing, where he met a warrior who hung on a rope, holding a giant's underwear. Drop that underwear and battle me, you ridiculous wooden clip man. I will pinch you and make you cry, Rock Warrior. Rock versus clothespin. Rock is victorious. Even though Rock had won, he was still unsatisfied. So he journeyed on to the mystical tower of Grandma's favorite apricot tree. And if you want to know the rest of the story, you should read it yourself. It's laugh out loud. They will want to read it over and over and over. And I found some several really good book trailers. Um, one um, introduces the characters. One you see Drew Daywalt talking about the book. And one is the official book trailer, but a must-see by everybody. And even if you're not elementary, I'm telling you, look at this book. Oh, and I also learned, I was telling Kiera earlier, that the origin, the true origin of The Legend of Rock, Paper, Scissors is it was actually invented in the 17th century. And it 
they used it in business. Yeah, in China. Mm. And then years and years later, it went to Japan. Um, so you'll find a link to that in the Life Binder. Very cool. Oh, so here we go for a nonfiction work. We were talking earlier about narrative nonfiction. Um, and one of the things I always keep my eye out for is narrative nonfiction for middle graders. Um, it's not, we don't see a whole lot of it. You, you know, you got Steve Schenken, of course, at the very top um, doing wonderful yeah. stuff. But I'm always sort of curious, you know, what other um, books are coming out for, for that middle grade reader who wants that narrative informational text. And A Dog in the Cave, The Wolf Who Made Us by Kay Frydenberg, um, you know, fits that bill. It's 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 interesting because there's so many books about dogs, nonfiction books about dogs, so it's really kind of hard to stand out from the pack, so to speak. <laughs> um, but this is such a fascinating uh, topic, and I think a really well-designed text, um, a lot of photographs mixed in that sort of break up um, the information and then kind of make it digestible. What Frydenborg is exploring is the co-evolution and the cooperation um, between early humans and wolves. Um, and this is a relationship it was recently discovered um, that began way earlier than scientists used to think. Um, around 1994, um, carbon dating revealed these sort of wolf-like dog tracks right alongside those of a young boy in France. Um, and what they determined is that human beings and dog companions have actually been together for over 26,000 years, um, which is incredible. And so the author expertly sort of lays out the scientific history um, about evolution and explains the various theories and anthropological theories, um, including how dog breeds have come to be, um, starting with wolves and then being domesticated dogs. And now we have hundreds and hundreds of different dog breeds and how that sort of came to be. Um, but beyond the content itself, what I think is so interesting about this book and really useful, especially as a report and assignment book, is how the author unfolds the science and, you know, kind of delves into how scientists think, how their brains work, and the kinds of questions that scientists ask. Um, she talks about how theories are tested and come to be accepted fact. Um, also, the ways that different scientists from different fields um, cooperate and often have to work together in, in order to strengthen theories um, and knowledge. It's a very compelling um, sort of premise. It has this interdisciplinary focus. Um, so, you know, obviously kids who are really into animals um, will be interested, but also kids who are interested in other STEM topics, I think, will really gravitate towards this um, and makes really good report, report writing. That is Dog in the Cave. Dog in the Cave. And who knew there was a dog scientist? I had no idea. Yeah, The things great. you learn. I know. <laughs> um, so in our PG middle category, um, which we also have a PG high in case you're new to Junior Library Guild. Um, here we have a story that's historical fiction. It's the 1950s. It's Detroit. And Marjorie is 12 years old, and she um, has a family. How about that? She's 12 years old, and she's not an orphan. Um, but um, she's living in a time when um, – People are still recovering from the effects of World War II, and there is um, fear of communism everywhere. And she and her friend um, kind of have a – not a fallen out, but she starts to question who are really her friends are because a new girl has moved into town, and she dresses like she came straight from the old country. And she doesn't speak any English. And um, is this the right book, or I'm, I'm going into another book that I just finished? It is another book I just finished. That is part of Joplin wishing. How weird is that? We go straight from that <laughs> to this. Wow. Okay, so I read so many books. But it's the same thing. People think that uh, Marjorie is a communist because of how she looks and what she says and what she thinks and what her family's doing. And um, she is kind of caught in the middle. And um, it's a story of how she deals with the enemy. enemy. And, and I was really mm. surprised by this book because it's Sarah Holbrook, so I was expecting a novel in verse because I used her mm. books to teach poetry the whole time I was a teacher. And so I was delighted to see this verse novel, really, by Sarah Holbrook. Very nice. 
And last but not least, Last but not least is the adorable Moto and Me. Um, this is obviously a popular pick, and you can see why. It's the story, the true story of how a wildlife photographer um, orphaned a serval kitten named Moto at the Masai Mara National Reserve in Kenya. Their striking photography, adorable information about how she fed, groomed, and taught the serval kitten how to hunt and survive in the wild, and how this animal slowly transitioned back into the wild. So it's an obvious great pick for kids who love animals, but also any kids who are interested in um, wild animals, their habitats, and learning more about the people who work so, so hard to protect these animals and keep the wild places wild for them, and who can resist these adorable little furry faces. <laughs> oh, and just it's precious, just precious. And um, I'm going to go back and redeem myself because I was right about the enemy. Should not question myself. Oh. Yes, there's a girl who does come to school and has to, um, and she has to decide does she want to side with the enemy, enemy in quotes, or not. So I was right. Yay. You sounded right. Um, <laughs> I sounded right, but then I questioned what I was talking mm -hmm. about. Um, so you asked for more books. So, again, be sure that you download today's handout from the resources folder, and now is a good time to do that, um, where you'll find two related books for each of today's featured books. So that's a total of 36 in 30 minutes. Um, now is also a good time to download your certificate of attendance in the certificate folder if you need it for credit. Um, Kara, why don't you share a bonus with our listeners? Yes. Junior Library Guild members receive a discount on subscriptions to the Hornbook, Library Journal, and School Library Journal. So be sure to take advantage of that and subscribe today. We will, you'll find our list of stars, our list of popular picks, all sorts of roundups and collection development features, and many, many reviews, of course. And you'll also want to sign up for the Junior Library Guild monthly newsletter, um, which you'll see on our homepage. You just go to the um, monthly newsletter sign up and you'll find out when the next webcast is. Uh, but for now, I'm sad to say we're going to take a brief summer break and so mm -hmm. no webcast um, until August. So look for the new webcast to come in August and you'll find out what those will be about. Um, and then don't forget that we are also creating resources to help you use these books. So you'll find book trailers and lesson plans and related informational content and all those things you can't click on in the back of the book. And you'll find today's and other selections in our JLG Book Talks to Go Spring Live Binder. Uh, remember also to look at the book detail pages for a link to the Live Binder resources at Junior Library Talk.com, and you'll all find everything that you need on our webcast. Check our website after the webcast for the recap blog post. You'll find a list of all the books, including two related titles for each of today's 12 books. Don't miss these links to their book detail pages and other resources. And once again, now is a good time to click on that certificate folder and print your certificate of attendance. Thanks again to our co-host, Kira Purit for sending some, spending some time with us. And thank you to our listeners for supporting these authors and illustrators with your time. Be sure to ask your account rep about all our books and categories or contact our sales department for more information. After the webcast, you'll receive a short survey. Thank you for making time to give us feedback. Tomorrow, you'll receive an automatic email regarding today's webinar. If you follow the link, you can watch the archived webinar and print your certificate of attendance after 10 minutes of viewing. Until next time, thanks again for joining us, and as always, happy reading.